Good afternoon and welcome, friends. It is my privilege as the director of the Black Church Studies Certificate Program here at YDS to welcome you to this, the BP, BCSP graduation ceremony, 2023. First, I want to welcome our courageous graduates who have bravely navigated the harrowing COVID years. I welcome their families and their friends who have supported them. And I welcome those who can only be with us in the virtual space today. Welcome to the dean, to the faculty, and staff of YDS, and to all the program participants. We welcome all our other guests, an extended welcome today to our returning alum, Reverend C.C. Jones Davis, who will offer our graduation address. And if you wouldn't mind, if you would allow me in this moment, just an opportunity to introduce her to some of you so that we can allow the program to flow as printed. Reverend C.C. Jones Davis, works at the intersection of faith, art, and social justice. As an award-winning faith leader, facilitator, public speaker, and impact strategist to point people to the all-powerful and the least powerful. For the past 20 years, she's partnered with national organizations, organized and led dynamic grass movements, and used her voice to address issues of equity and inequity. You may be aware that she was so instrumental in the work of what is, what is now a freed person, just Julius Jones, but he had been on death row, and she was very instrumental in advocating for his release from death row, and continues that work, actually, in terms of developing increased advocacy and policy around the abolition necessary abolition of the death penalty. When she's not advocating or speaking, she's creating worship music. As a professional vocalist, she has performed across the country. Her latest album, Alive, is available on digital platforms. She, a, she is an ordained minister in the Disciples of Christ denomination and a proud member of the Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. She is a wife and mother of two children whom she's raising in Washington, D.C., and she's from Halifax County, Virginia, the home of the legendary Henrietta Lacks and the once largest slaveholding county in the state. Finally, we want to welcome God's spirit to shape and guide our gathering here today. And so we say welcome to you, and we say welcome to the Spirit of God. I'd like to ask if you would prepare now for the acknowledgement by our YDS alum, Reverend Althea Brooks, also a, B a Black Church Studies Committee member, after which we're going to follow the program as printed. Good afternoon, everyone. And as we say in the black church, greetings in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <laughs> greetings. Yale University acknowledges the indigenous peoples and nations, including the Moho Mohigo, the Mashantucket Pequot, the Eastern Pequot, the Shatikok, the Golden Hill Pogoset, the Niantic and Quinnipiac and Algonquin speaking peoples that have stewarded through generations the lands and waterways of what is now the state of Connecticut. We honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these peoples and nations and this land. 
And as Yale Divinity School recognizes the role that Christianity has played in colonization, it repudiates the use of Christianity or any other form of religion for the purposes of oppression. It encourages all to work for justice in the aftermath of colonization to reject racism and anti-indigenous attitudes in all forms. So, the Black Church Studies Certificate Program pauses. Today to acknowledge those ancestors of African descent whose legacies also illuminate our path. We remember Reverend James Pennington, former pastor of Shiloh Presbyterian Church in New York, the first person of color to audit classes at Yale Divinity School from 1832 to 1834. The MA degree was referred on him this year by the Yale, Board, the Yale Board of Trustees, along with Reverend Alexander Crummel, both of whom were denied the opportunity to formally enroll at Yale, but became significant leaders in the US and abroad. We remember. Mary A. Goodman, a former slave and laundress in New Haven, who in 1872 bequeathed her estate to Yale's theological department to educate men of color for the gospel ministry. We remember Reverend Samuel Melvin Coles, former pastor of Freedom Congregational Church in Texas, who as the first recipient of the Mary Goodman Scholarship was the first person of African descent to matriculate at Yale Divinity School in 1875. We remember Reverend Dr. Rena Walker Karifa Smart, the first woman tenured professor at Howard Divinity School and the first woman of African descent from Yale Divinity School to graduate from Yale Divinity School in 1945. We remember. We recognize their trailblazing efforts which have brought us to this very moment. Our hearts expand in gratitude as we now prepare for the musical invocation. Strength of my life 
I, I lift my hands in total praise to you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cece, and I just want you to know that it is really an honor and privilege to be here back at YDS for such a monumental occasion for this graduating class. Congratulations. This is so big, it's so huge. Congrats. I especially want to thank Reverend Joanne Jennings for the invitation, for coming to get me this morning, for being such an amazing hostess. And I also want to uh, honor and acknowledge our dean and all the faculty members who are in attendance today. In honor of and in recognition of this incredible journey that you all have traveled in order to get to this day, I like to speak from the Exodus story, Exodus chapter 15, verses 19 through 21. And here is what it reads. It says, when Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought the waters of the sea back over them. But the Israelites walked through the sea on dry ground. And then Miriam the prophet, Aaron's sister, she took a timbrel in her hand. And all the women followed her with timbrel and dancing. And Miriam sang to them, sing to the Lord for he is highly exalted. Both horse and rider he has hurled into the sea. For our reflection and encouragement today, I'd like to speak for just a few moments on the topic, remember the refrain. Remember the refrain. Let us pray. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who has brought us thus far on the way, Thou who has by thy might led us into the light. Keep us forever in the path, we pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. And the church said, Amen. Amen. African American people of faith relate deeply to the Exodus story. This story has been a pillar of our faith as we just like the Israelites have experienced the hardships of bondage and oppression in a strange land. It has been the God of the Exodus who we have put our trust in, a God who hears the cries of his people, a God who through many dangers, toils, and snares escorts his people out of Egypt through the wilderness and into the promised land. We worship the God of the Exodus. We sing about the God of the Exodus. We sing songs full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. We sing songs full of the hope that the present has brought us. 
songs that have been passed down from generation to generations, songs that remind us of God's faithfulness to us down through the years. In Exodus chapter 15, we find the Israelites running from Pharaoh after 430 years of slavery. His army is behind them and the Red Sea is in front of them. It seems that they would die if they moved forward, that they would die if they turned around. But the Bible says that just in the nick of time, God steps in that God parts the Red Sea, and the Israelites are then able to cross over on dry ground. Pharaoh's army, however, not so lucky today. It says that the horses and the chariots and the horsemen, they went into the sea, and that the Lord brought the waters back over them. Not one of them survived. But God's people, God's people have made it over. God's people, they are safe, they are dry. God's people are relieved and they are thankful. And right here on the other side of this situation, right here on the other side of the Red Sea, it seems like a good time for a praise. And so with exuberant detail, Moses begins to lead the Israelites into a musical medley of God's miraculous deeds. Line after line, which are recorded in Exodus 15, verses 1 through 18. They sing about all the particulars, how, how God brought them out, what they saw God do, how they saw their enemies swept away by the Red Sea. Moses' song is a beautiful song, but it is a long song. Moses' song is a powerful song, y'all. It's just a long song. And long songs with too many verses do not pass down well to a people on the move. Nobody loves a good hymn with five verses more than I do, but long songs with too many verses do not pass down well to a people on the move. The Israelites needed something else. They needed something new. They needed something succinct. They needed something that they could remember. And so in verses 19 through 21, a prophet named Miriam, she steps forward to help God's people learn a refrain. A refrain is the chorus of a song. It is short and simple and to the point. The refrain is the part of a song that we can all remember. We don't need a screen. We don't need to hold the hymn book because the refrain is the part of a song that is etched in our memories and etched in our hearts. And the purpose of a, of a refrain is to repeat over and over and over again to ourselves and to each other, what is the message? What is the theme? What is the point? Miriam turns to that crowd and she leads them into a chorus and she says, sing to the Lord for he is highly exalted. Both horse and rider he has turned, hurled into the sea. Miriam gives the people of God a refrain, just a few lines that can be etched in their memories and etched in their hearts. A refrain about God's power, about God's protection, about God's provision, about God's mercy, about God's grace. It's a refrain about God's activity in the human story. And today, we continue to be a people on the move. You are a people on the move. And while there are so many verses, that is to say, there are so many details, there's so many questions, there's so many critiques, there's so many commentaries, there's so many theological debates and diversities, we are not able to hold on to it all. Yeah. Some things will get lost in transport. Yeah. 
Some things will get lost in translations, and so we still need a chorus. Something basic, something that will help you to remember the refrain of this faith. What is the message? What is the thing? What, what is the point? We need a chorus that reminds us of God's grace, God's power, God's mercy, God's provision, God's love, that reminds us of how far God has brought our people. We need a refrain. But Miriam doesn't just teach us a refrain, y'all. Miriam also teaches us something about reclamation. Miriam teaches us that when you leave a place, there are some things that are worth taking with you. It is peculiar to me that in the midst of a crisis situation that Miriam brings a timbrel, a timbrel, it's small, a timbrel, it's just a little thing that keeps a rhythm and keeps a noise, but it is odd to me that in the midst of this huge transition, Miriam has a timbrel. When the Israelites have, are on their way leaving Egypt, I would imagine that they would need to be leaving in a hurry. I would imagine that there was only time to pack what was essential to pack what was important. So why, class of 2023, why then would Miriam have a timbre? Why would she pack something that seems to be so small, so insignificant, so unimportant? I believe that Miriam has a timbre because Miriam has always had a timbre. Miriam had a praise in bondage, and now Miriam has brought her praise to the other side of the Red Sea. In other words, Miriam has developed a rhythm. She has decided that no matter what her social location may be, that she would bless the Lord at all times, and that his praises would continually be in her mouth. I believe that Miriam decided that the rhythm of her life would not be based upon her geography. That the rhythm of her life would not be based upon her circumstances. I believe that Miriam tapped into the power of her praise and I believe this helped Miriam not forget what brought her over. I believe that this timbrel helped remind her of who brought her through? And church, I'm here today just to say that we still need timbrels. Lest our feet stray from the places, our God, where we met thee. We need timbrels, church, lest our hearts, drunk from the wine of this world, we forget thee. We are. You are a people on the move. And you will need to decide what things are still useful, what things are still meaningful, what things are still holy. Do not forget the small things. In the age of faith deconstruction, and let me say deconstruction is very, very important, I do have to say that I am so grateful that I come from a people who have taught me not to throw everything away. A people who have had to repurpose the scraps a people who have had to have a holy imagination about what is possible with what is broken. I'm grateful today that I come from a people who did not throw the Bible away even when it was used to keep us in bondage for 267 years. I'm glad to come from a people who did not throw Jesus away even while crosses burn rampant in our yards. This is a people with a holy imagination, a people who worship the God of the Exodus, 
and find a chorus in the liberating power of Jesus the Christ. These are the ancestors who told us to sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. They told us to sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Church, I want you to know that you don't have to throw everything away. There's so much to learn from our ancestors. There's so much to learn from black folks in this country and around this world about reclaiming broken things and finding ourselves and our people in God's story. Even when others have tried to shut us out of God's story. Yes, there are some things, despite the pain of it all, that are worth fighting for some things worth taking with us as we go from place to place. Timbrels, like hymns and scriptures. Timbrels, like line songs and devotion services. Timbrels, like granny and granddaddy's prayers. Choruses, like lead me, guide me along the way. For if you lead me, I will not stray. Lord, let me walk each day with thee. Lead me, O Lord. Lead me. You are peace builders. You are ministers of this gospel. You are ministers of justice, and you need something to hold on to. You are pastors. You are public theologians and you will need something to hold on to. We strive to fulfill the requirement that the prophet Micah laid out for us in Micah 6, 8, when he says, for what does the Lord require? But that we do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. And this is what we are trying to do. We're trying to live this thing out in a world that is broken and thirsting for living water, but if I were to give you any wisdom, I would want you to remember that what the Lord requires, it also requires the Lord. That is to say, we need God in order to do God things. We need spiritual tools to anchor us in the journey that is ahead class of 2023, my prayer for you today is that you would remember the refrain of this holy faith, which is peace, love, mercy, justice. I pray that you do not forget your timbrels. I pray that along this way, that you not throw everything away. And may the admonition of our ancestors be etched in your memories and etched in your hearts, facing the rising sun of our new day begun. Let us march on till victory is won. After taking Reverend Dr. Barber's class, it reminds me that in moments like this when we're asked to remember the refrain, that this is one of those moments that we can, rec- we, we can create one. So I want you to sing something for me. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Can you sing that, please? One. Here you go. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Are you ready to go onward? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Are you ready to go onward? Then I want to add this in. Oh, oh, yes, I am. Try that. 
Oh, yes, I am. Are you ready to go onward? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Are you ready to go onward? Yes, I'm to O N. Oh, yes, I am. I'm going to take something from my classes with me. So thank you for trying that with me. To dream the impossible dream To fight the unbeatable foe To bear with unbearable sorrow To run where the brave do not go To ride the unrightable wrong to love pure and chase from afar to try when your arms are too weary to reach the unreachable star this is my quest to follow that star no matter how hopeless, no matter how far, without question or pause, to be willing to go on, to be willing to march into hell for a heavenly cause. And I know that my ride will be true to this glorious day. That my heart, pure and peaceful and calm, till I'm laid to my rest. And the world will be better for this, that someone's scorned and covered with scars, still strong with their last of courage to reach the unreachable to reach the unreachable to reach the unreachable have these more. <laughs> we have now the privilege of presenting certificates to those persons who uh, have participated in the Black Church Study Certificate Program. And so we're going to call your names. And as we do so, would you come and receive your certificate, please? And uh, Dean Gettler, my boss. <laughs> You all know better than that, right? <laughs> we are so pleased to present these certificates. First to Ryan Lindsay Arundel. <laughs> Next to Countess C. Cooper. Next to Christopher Johnson Fatherly. Oh, 
I'm not very good at this. <laughs> Norlene V. Jackson. <laughs> You should be going over there. Sarah N. Menard. <laughs> Averin A. Payne. I don't know what's next on the program. Thank you. Good day, beloved friends, family, faculty, staff, and alum, colleagues and clergy, and our clouds of witnesses. I am rejoicing and I am glad because I stand before you as the daughter of and in the presence of my parents, Luca and Nicole Menard, who are the children of Marguerite Surville, Nor Novillien, Merci Vierge saint Elust, and Frasilom Frasil, who were the children of Sarah Jean Baptiste, Casimir saint Elust, Pradieu Frasil, and Eunice de Wance. They too are the descendants of a people whose faith in God fueled their fight for freedom. We are, I am, the descendants of a people from a mountainous land among the Caribbean islands, and because of them, I am here. And because of them and God's grace, we will continue to move through spaces not built for our bodies to inhabit. We will continue to tell the stories that were silenced and never meant to be told. As I reflect on my time here at YDS, I remember my first semester when I tied the Haitian flag around my purse as a reminder that I have not arrived here by myself or for myself. And wherever I go, my cloud of witnesses go with me. I wore my flag to not forget my identity. I repped my flag because somebody only knew about one narrative about Haiti. And because I knew that I would meet someone who never met a Haitian American woman from Bridgeport at Yale. Similarly to the ways that I came through these doors as I prepare to walk out of these doors, I wear my flag around my neck because my Haitian diasporic identity found a home in the Black Church Studies Program certificate here at Yale. And I thought how fitting that our ceremony today would be on Haitian Flag Day. So with that, I'd like to leave you all with a brief reflection titled, Raise and Rep Your Flag. The Haitian flag is described as a horizontally striped blue-red national flag and it incorporates the national coat of arms on a central white panel. In 1791, the Haitian slave revolt began and lasted until 1803. 12 years of fighting after centuries under French colonial rule. Haitian independence was declared on January 1st, 1804, marking the first successful slave revolt that would birth a black sovereign nation in this Western Hemisphere. As a result of IET's liberation from the French, whose flag consisted of red, white, and blue vertical stripes, the story passed down from generation says that the Haitian revolutionary leader, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, removed the white stripes from the tricolor and assigned Catherine Flon to sew the red and blue together on May 18, establishing the new blue-red flag, 
which represented the black and mulatto populations. This became the symbol of the Haitian masses. The coat of arms consists of palm trees surrounded, surmounted by a liberty cap, flags, rifles, hatchets, cannon, anchors, masks, and other symbols. And the motto, l'union fait la force, union makes strength, is also found at the center of the flag. Friends, as I reflect on this ceremonious day, which is woven into this Haitian flag day, my mind imagines the many functions of a flag. Flags are waved, pledged to, part of ceremonies used in worship. They are symbols of our identities and even used in times of warfare. I am reminded of the text found in Isaiah 59 verse 19, one of those verses that is often used as a call and response. It's often recited, but it's not always explained or understood. Some versions say, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will raise a standard. Well, growing up, I didn't always understand what a standard meant, but I learned that it was synonymous to a military or ceremonial flag carried on a pole or hoisted on a rope. So as I recall the many times throughout the past few years here at YDS where I doubted my voice among theological debates and I questioned my beliefs among a sea of God talk, when my body hesitated to express its usual embodied worship among a less charismatic movement, when my assignments were late because I was seeking perfection, not progress, when an internal voice spoke softly but loudly, playing a game of tug of war with every thought and decision I had to make. And when I had to make a choice to not allow one narrative about my Haitian diasporic identity to be that of a white, heteronormative, disembodied, ungodly, and unjust sound, the spirit of the Lord reminded me to raise my banner, to remember my ancestors, to say their names, to find my voice in my writing, and to use my body to make a joyful noise during worship, to rep my flag. Colleagues, what and where is your flag? It might not be tied to a nation or a particular identity. Maybe it's a new flag that you are called to design or to establish to make it known that you are where you are supposed to be. You are where you are supposed to be because you belong where you are and where you are going. As I take my seat, I want to remind us that above all of the flags, above all of the banners and standards we could raise, there is a banner that needs no other iteration. It's a banner that no one can take from you. It is a banner that when it is raised and lifted high, it draws all creation unto them. When you cannot locate your physical banner, there is a name. It is the name Jehovah Nisi, which means the Lord is my banner. May we keep this banner close to our lips. May the name of this banner be resounded through our voices. May this banner remind us at, as it reminded me that our black bodies, our mind, our sound, our culture, our names, our voices, our movements, our identities are created in the image and likeness of the Lord, our banner. May we go and rep our flags and raise our banners in the days to come. God bless. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> First, I want to congratulate all of you who are receiving degrees this weekend and who have just received your certificate. You've done something pretty remarkable and I, I have to say I take no greater pleasure in anything I do than in what happens this weekend. 
it is to celebrate you and what you have accomplished. And I say that on my behalf, on behalf of all the faculty and all the staff of the entire school. We salute you. Only about 13% of people in America have a master's degree. And you have one from a very selective university. Let me try to illustrate that. I spent 23 years at the University of Notre Dame. And when I would travel, if I was in the United States, and they said, where are you from? And I'd say, Notre Dame, everybody would immediately know. But when I got to Europe, or Africa, or South America, and I said, the University of Notre Dame, they would hear the latter part, and they'd say, the cathedral in Paris? <laughs> And then I'd have to explain. But I have never had to explain when somebody said, where are you from? And I said, Yale. And from now on, you will never have to explain if somebody asks you, where did you get your degree? And you answer Yale, they will immediately know what that means. It will change your life. You have a platform that you would never otherwise have. I hope you take great satisfaction in earning your degree. But I also want to commend you because you have done it over a period of 38 months that has been exceptionally trying. All of us are aware of that. You've not only had to worry about your health, but the health of your families and your friends. It's not just that we've had to juggle schedules that some things have had to be virtual rather than in person. It's been that mental strain, and you have persevered, and I salute you for it. Now, I could say what I've just said to every group of graduates this weekend, but I'm going to say something now to you that I can only say to you. I want to thank you. You came to an institution in transition, to an institution that is trying to make peace and make amends for past wrongs. Things are not where they need to be, but I think things have at least progressed. You have helped. And it is because of your presence, because of your advocacy, because of what you have stood for, that I say thank you. It's not easy. It's not easy for anyone. I think of a minister from the 19th century by the name of Theodore Parker, who in 1853 preached a sermon. He was a noted abolitionist here in New England, lived just to the north of us up in Massachusetts in the Boston area. And this is what he said. I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The ark is a long one. My eye reaches but little ways. I cannot calculate the curve and complete the figure by experience of sight. I can divine it by conscience. And from what I see, I am sure that it bends towards justice. Another American minister, whom we know much better, Martin Luther King Jr., knew that sermon. And when he came to the end of the long journey from Selma to Montgomery, he knew that the people listening to him speaking were asking in their minds, how long, how long will we have to do this before things are made right? And so King asked their question in the sermon, repeatedly. He said, how long? And then he immediately said, not long, and gave a reason. Here is his last answer. How long? Not long, because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. King wasn't delusional. He didn't think that this was some kind of excuse for people to simply 
pass off the efforts that needed to be made, he was very much aware of what had to be done. I don't think he could have envisioned that more than 50 years later, the first African-American president in the history of this country would take this quotation and would recite it again and again and then emblazon it in the rug of the Oval Office. It isn't an excuse for anyone not to work. It's the reality that, yes, things can get better. So what I ask you to do today, and my hope for you, is that you will not grow weary or lose heart, but that you will continue to show the perseverance that you have in these last two or three years, depending on your degree, and that you will in your life continue to work for justice wherever you are. To remember the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. May we all, black and white, work together for that justice. That is our charge. May God be with you. It is my privilege now to acknowledge the many people who make this particular program run. It is a collaborative program here at YDS, and we rely on everybody for their support to make it meaningful. I want to acknowledge the faculty because their courses help frame the program. I want to acknowledge the quad partners, particularly ISM, because they've shared their space and their resources with us immeasurably over the last year. I want to acknowledge Andover Newton because they shifted their retreat so that we could have ours. Thank you. I want to acknowledge the YDS staff, Tim Goslin, who works tirelessly to make sure people get paid. Dean Gettler and the vocational leadership team who support me. Dean Randall and the Office of Admissions who today have prepared our reception and decorated our place. I had nothing to do with that. They did that for us. For Dean Sullivan at the DIB office. For Sachin and Brock who have been tireless tech supporters. I want to acknowledge the BCSP committee. We have a few members here today, Reverend Brooks you've heard from. Sarah has been on this committee since she, for the last four years, and we thank her for that, or three. However, she's been there. And I also want to particularly thank my assistant this year, the Reverend Norleen V. Jackson. What you don't know is she has chosen to take a learning curve, which has made it possible for us to have great pictures, to have great videos. Now, if you go to our website, you're going to be current because of her. So I appreciate you, Norlene. Thank you so much. And to all the program participants today, I am incredibly grateful to each and every one of you, especially to our guest speaker. And to the graduates and their peers who have helped shape this program, thank you. Thank you for your ideas. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your participation. Thank you for your critique, because all of that allows us to grow. I want to affirm all of those who are graduating in the coming days. And I want to acknowledge an undergraduate in our midst. Last year, uh, Dr. Shelley introduced us to Echo Bensi and Chill. He's down there in the back hiding out. And he has so willingly shared his musical gifts with us. 
and uh, he is going to be graduating with a bachelor's in computer science, I believe. He's off to Skadden Apps Law Firm as a legal practice assistant. However, I am anticipating that he will do an MDiv JD one day. So I asked him to come today so I could say that publicly. <laughs> and of course, I must acknowledge those who pray for us. For many of you, sometimes by name each week, there is in North Carolina a group of folk who pray Mondays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. And I ask them to place our program in their ongoing prayer list. And sometimes, because the need is great, I ask them to pray for us, some of you by name. They have been so faithful. And I want you to know that those prayers are going to help fuel your future. Because the good thing about prayer is it doesn't go disappear. You know, the prayers that have been said for us for generations outlive us. And so I have every expectation that you're going to be buoyed on the prayers that have been prayed for you that you know not of. Now, I want to invite everybody who's graduating, not just the BCSP people, but everybody who's graduating to come because today, Dr. Yes, you too, Echo. Come on up here. <laughs> Dr. Uh, Turner is going to lead us in our blessing as we close. That means Abigail. That means Roderick. That means everyone. We want to include, we're not leaving anybody out. <laughs>